Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to talk about variational autoencoders, which is an intersection of two fields, neural networks, specifically autoencoders, which is a type of neural networks, and variational inference, and specifically stochastic gradient descent or stochastic variational inference um, that uses the reparameterization trick. So what is the goal? Well, if you read the original paper, it seems like that the main goal, or at least the way they presented it, was to do more general purpose VI. So until then, the main algorithm used was CAVI, coordinate ascent VI, and it assumes this really approximating quality that the, that the variational distribution decomposes into a product of individual uh, distribution pair parameter or pair Latin variable which basically means you lose all the correlation structure. Okay, and they wanted to do something else, which is more general purpose. And so they basically introduced the reparameterization trick, uh, which was also later used in ADVI, automatic differentiation VI. And they also gave a possible application, which were autoencoders, or how they called it variational base autoencoders. And these are now known as variational autoencoders. And what they have is basically they are autoencoders that have a more regularized Latin space. And I think this application exploded and generated a lot of interest in variational autoencoders because of its ability to create new data out of this Latin space. So let's start. First thing, what are autoencoders? So autoencoders are a neural network architecture that encodes data usually into a smaller dimension. So you put data in yeah, you put the data in, it encodes it into some latent dimension, and you can restore your data from this latent representation. And if I'm not mistaken, it's mainly used for compression or dimensionality reduction. So imagine that you feed images, and even if they are really small, like 28 by 28 pixels, and maybe just one channel, so it's, so it's 784 dimensions, 784 pixels, and you can compress it, say, to 20 dimensions. So maybe you can find a way, for your data at least, to compress it to be a much, much smaller size. And then you just carry this data and you transfer this data. And whenever you need this data, you use the decoder to get back from this compressed version to the real version, or at least something that might look like your original data because the encoding and then decoding might lose some information uh, that was present. Now, you would think that this can also be used for generation of new data. For example, maybe you have your uh, really great picture of yourself, but it has glasses and you just want would have wished that you could just kind of use the exact same picture only without glasses. So maybe in this latent space, maybe there's a dimension where if you traverse it, the only thing that changes is if the picture has glasses or doesn't have glasses in it. Or just in more general, maybe you have a lot of pictures of cats and you want to create new cats that have not been in your data. Can you somehow sample um, new points in this latent space and then use the decoder and generate new images. Um, well, it turns out that for regular autoencoders, this is not a very useful thing um, because the Z space here is very messy. So the encoding and decoding, it, it just tries to, for your data, recreate the same data after you encode it. It doesn't care so much about how it uh, saves the representation in the Z space. So it can be a very, very messy Z space. So here is a 2D dimension of a Z space on the MNIST data where each color is a different digit. And you can see it's it doesn't look so good, right? It's like a, a lot of mess here. So you have red with green and purple. And so it's not really, really fixed. So for the single point, it might be able to restore it, but it doesn't really give a good solution to these two problems that I gave here. So now, just for notation, suppose that the encoder is denoted by an F function and it's parameterized by the neural network's weights, which are denoted by W. And then the decoder, we can denote it by G and it's parameterized by W dash. And so W and W dash are the weights of the neural network where here it's W and here it's W dash. And then the loss function, there can be all kinds of loss, but what you could think of is maybe to take the square difference. So you take your original data, you pass it through the encoder, then the decoder, and you want it to be as close as possible to the original data. So you look at their differences and you, and if they are vector, you take this uh, L2 norm and you square it. Okay. And then in neural networks, what you do is you take gradients of, of this loss with regards to all the weights of the neural networks and you do stochastic gradient descent. 
Now note that here, both the output of the encoder, the Z, and the output of the decoder are considered fixed. So it's not a distribution, they are fixed. Once the weights of the encoder and decoder are found, for a given X, you will always get the same Z, and for a given Z, you will always get the same X. Okay, so this is outer encoders. What is variational inference? So variational inference is a way to approximate hard to compute posteriors or any other types of distributions, but usually posteriors. So this is a posterior, yeah? So suppose we have an X and it somehow depends on some latent uh, dimension or latent variable Z. And the uh, posterior is the distribution of Z given your data. So it's equal to the likelihood to the probability of your data given Z times the prior over Z divided by the evidence. So basically uh, the integral of the numerator over all the possible Zs. And so the denominator is usually intractable and you can't really find this posterior. It's a real problem in Bayesian inference, how to find this posterior. So what variational inference does, it says, okay, let's try to use some distribution that we can control, let's say a Gaussian, and we can try and move its mean and its standard deviation and fit the knobs, the parameters of this distribution until it looks as much as close as possible to the true posterior. But we don't really know the true posteriors. We only know it up to a normalizing constant. We know the numerator. We don't know the denominator. So we use a specific matrix, which is called the KL divergence, which allows us to ignore uh, the denominator. And it will still try to optimize the distance. Once we get rid of the denominator, we only care about the rest, the rest of the terms. And these are called the elbow, the evidence lower bound. So if we take the KL divergence between this variational distribution and the true posteriors, this is the definition of the KL divergence. Uh, this can be thought of as the expectation with regards to Q of Z of log QZ, and this decomposes into log QZ minus log posterior. Then we use base formula on the posterior. It breaks to the numerator, which is here, and the denominator. Okay, so this whole thing is also equal to P of X. P of X doesn't depend on Z in any way, so the so we can eliminate the expectation. We are left with this, and this, since it doesn't depend on Q of Z, on the parameters of Q of Z, when we will optimize the KL, we'll try to minimize it, this doesn't change. So it's constant to us, we can ignore it. This is what is left, and the negative of this is called the elbow. So minimizing the KL is like maximizing the elbow. And with some more assumption, we can also do what is called CAVI, according to CENPI, and in the exponential family, there's another thing to do, which is stochastic gradient ascent VI. And I have a whole course about this on my channel. You are welcome to check it out. But back to variational outer inference, Kingma and Welling, they didn't want to do these algorithms and take these assumptions. They wanted a more general purpose algorithm. So they just want to somehow compute the gradients of the elbow and then do gradient descent. Okay, so here we have the elbow again. We want to take the gradients of it. Um, and this is another way to write the elbow. And so what was done until their time was to try to push the gradient into the integral by Leibniz rule. Okay, and so we did this here. And then, well, this depends on the parameters and this depends on the parameters. So we use rules of derivatives. And first we take the derivative of only this times the rest. And then we add the derivative of this times this. Okay, so this is what we have here, but this term turns out to be zero because if we take the derivative of this, this doesn't depend at all on the parameters. It just becomes zero. This becomes one over Q of Z times the uh, inner derivative. And so this and this cancels. And then we only have the integral of the derivative of Q of Z. We use an inverse of the Leibniz rule and we take the derivative outside of the integral. And then we have an integral of Q of Z, which is just one because Q of Z is a valid distribution and then the derivative of one is just zero. So this whole term just cancels out. Then we use the log derivative trick, which is just saying that the derivative of Q of Z is equal to Q of Z times the derivative of the log of Q of Z. And you can just verify it because the derivative of this, we just saw it, it's one over, it's equal to this thing over here. And if we multiply it by Q of Z, we get this thing. So it's a pretty obvious trick. And if we do that, uh, we get this expression over here. And then we say, okay, let's let's sample disease from the current uh, variational distribution that we have, even though our parameters at this moment might not be accurate. Let's just take uh, samples from that and evaluate 
this expression, it only involves terms that we know, so like the likelihood, the prior, and the variational distribution. And we use a Monte Carlo uh, approximation of this mean, and we get a gradient. And so this whole process is what is, what is called a log derivative trick. And you can compute the elbow derivatives. The problem is that they have high variance. So the gradients are basically bad and a lot of times are useless. Some algorithms manage to make it better. For example, black box VI, which I also have a video about and you can check it out on my channel. But what Kingma and Welling did instead was the reparameterization trick. They said, okay, let's suppose that instead of drawing from a distribution that depends on the parameters, yeah, so we are drawing from a distribution that depends on the parameters. Instead, let's draw from a neutral distribution, a distribution that does not depend on the parameters, and then transform it using a function which will also involve the parameters to um, the real distribution that we want to sample from. Okay, so if we have this differentiable transformation, we can sample from this neutral distribution, pass it through this transformation and get our real variables. And then when we take the gradient, it's not with regards to what we are sampling with, it's with regards to the transformation. And so this is basically the reparameterization trick. We don't do all of this. We just start from taking the gradient. We immediately move to this new representation of the distribution. We sample from that, and then we calculate for each of the samples, we calculate the, the terms and we average them, and then we take the gradient of that. Okay, so when can you use the reparameterization trick? For example, if you have a location scale family of distribution like the normal. Um, so if you have a normal distribution that depends on a mean and sigma square, then instead of sampling from this distribution, and then taking their derivative with regards to mu and sigma squared, you sample from a standard normal distribution and you make a transformation using the parameters and you get, so now X of Z really distributes the way we want it to distribute, but we didn't sample from it. And this allows us to take the gradients without the log derivative trick and doesn't suffer from so much high variance. And so this is one way we can do it. Another way we can do it is if we have a tractable CDF, we can just do inverse sampling or inverse CDF. So for example, if we have an exponential distribution, we instead of sampling from an exponential distribution that depends on some parameter lambda, yeah, so if we want that our X or Z distribute exponentially with lambda, instead of sampling from a distribution that depends on the parameter, we can actually sample from a uniform distribution in the range of zero one and then use this transformation. And why is that? Well, notice that if we look at the CDF of this transformed variable, we get that in the end, it's equal to the CDF of an exponential distribution. And this is called inverse transform sampling. I also have a video about this in my channel, by the way. Another place where we can use the reparameterization trick if we have composition. So for example, a sum of exponential distributes gamma. So again, instead of sampling from a gamma that has two parameters that we want later to uh, take the derivative of, we can sample just from a uniform distribution, uh, transform each one to an exponential distribution, and then sum a lot of them or n of them until we get the distribution that we want. And there are also other ways that you can do approximation to the inverse CDF to get other distributions. Yes, but usually it's done with the normal distribution in this way, as I mentioned. So again, instead of sampling from this distribution, you sample from this distribution and you transform the variables like this. Okay, so how does variational inference with the reparameterization trick and autoencoders get together? So introducing variational autoencoders. And in order to follow the paper, I'm going to make a notational shift. So the parameters in the VI of the variational distribution, the ones that we can control, I denoted them by theta, I'm going to denote them by phi. Um, Q of Z, Okay, so the variational distribution um, of Z, I'm going to call it Q of Z given X, which is also true. It's also true for my previous videos where I didn't denote the dependency on X explicitly, but here I do want to show it because uh, as we will see, it makes more sense. And also PX given Z, here we are going to say that it's not fixed, but it's rather depends on another set of parameters that we are going to denote by theta. And now what we are going to say, we are going to say that in the Z space, we are going to have a distribution over the Z space and the output of 
uh, the X also is going to have a distribution. So we're going to have a prior over the Z and we're, for example, going to make it uh, a normal distribution with uh, identity matrix. And for the likelihood, we can also, for example, assume that it's a normal distribution and it has some mean vector and a variance covariance matrix. And the parameters of this distribution are the output of a neural network. So if we now assume that mu and sigma are some functions of Z, some very complex nonlinear function of Z, the posterior becomes uh, intractable. And you can look at it like this. So Px of Z, you actually, for a given Z, you pass it through this really hard and complex function, which is a neural network. And then you get two outputs, um, the mean and the sigma, and you place them in the normal distribution. And you say, okay, for that given Z, we have this given uh, mean and covariance matrix. And now the data that comes from this Z will distribute like this. And so here we assume normal distribution, but we, we can also assume discrete distribution. Like for example, if the output is discrete and zero one, it can be a Bernoulli distribution. If there's a few more options, it can be a categorical distribution. So we can model all kinds of data that we have, not just um, continuous data. And since we are going to optimize now the data as well, we have here maximum likelihood that is done in addition to the variational inference. So this is not classical VI because in classical VI, we are caring about finding the posterior and we assume that the likelihood is fixed. But here there are two moving parts. We will update the likelihood and we will update the posterior. And so this was the likelihood, the posterior, well, we can't really find the true posterior, it's intractable, we will use variational inference, we will denote this um, variational family parameterized by phi, and we will model this also by a normal distribution, uh, which the parameters of are outputted by a neural network. Okay, so here we place an x into this really complex function, a neural network, it will give us a mean and a variance, here they used in the paper a diagonal covariance, and then we will say the z are distributed according to a normal distribution with this mean and this standard deviation or variance. Now, look, this really mirrors the autoencoders. For a given x, we get a distribution over the z's, and for a given z's, we get a distribution over the x's, and we want to optimize both this function and this function in order that for a given x, the rebuilt x, or at least the mean of the rebuilt x, which we will choose to be our uh, best choice of what is the x hat, uh, will be as close together. So it mirrors the autoencoder structure, but here we treat the outputs as parameters of a distribution and not of fixed outputs. So what is the loss? Turns out that the elbow from before really captures the loss that we need, but we can also change it a bit. So this is the elbow from before, Notice that um, it now has dependence on two parameters, not just the phi, but also the thetas. And we can decompose this into these two and then take this and this and join them into the minus KL divergence. You can verify for yourself that it's true, plus this term over here. Why is it good to do so? Well, in some cases, for example, when we choose uh, this to be a Gaussian and this to be a Gaussian, this is an analytical term that is very easy to compute. So for example, for two Gaussians in a 1D case, it's equal to this thing over here. And if this is our uh, first Gaussian and this is our second Gaussian, then it's just equal to this thing over here for one dimension. And if you go to a diagonal matrix, it becomes this. But the main point to get here is that it's very easy to compute um, this KL. And this is why we changed the formulation here a bit. Okay, so overall, this is our loss, okay? This is how uh, we look at it. And note that, again, the first objective is optimized only with regards to phi, so the weights of the encoder. And the second objective is optimized both with regards to phi and both with regards to theta. So let's think what is going on here. So the author said, this is our objective. We will optimize this objective. There are two ways of looking at what's going on here. One is looking only at each uh, term by itself, okay? So looking at the loss functions. And we can divide it into a loss function, right? This part over here, if we take a Monte Carlo estimate of it, it becomes this, right? And again, this is because we use the reparameterization trick. 
So the Z is equal to a sample from a standard normal distribution times the sigma output by the encoder plus the mu outputted by the encoder. So this is again our elbow and we can divide it into a reconstruction term and a regularizer. Okay, so this term, if we uh, optimize it with regards to both theta and phi, we'll try to make the output look as much as similar to the input. This term does something into the latent space. So it says, it says change something in the latent space, make it a bit different. And what it does, it makes it more regular. So it makes it less messy. Now note that actually this thing over here, the reconstruction is somewhat equivalent to the regular autoencoder loss that we saw from before. So this was the autoencoder loss that we saw from before. If we look now at this, if we look at this reconstruction term, we said, okay, it's equal to a Monte Carlo estimate of it. And this is the log of a normal distribution. So I'll just write the log of this normal distribution over here. I notice that both the mean and the variance are a function of both the weights of the decoder and the Z's, which are themselves also a function of the weights of the encoder, okay? Now, this term doesn't depend on the parameters, we can throw it out. And so we are left with this. If we assume, for example, that the variance is just the identity matrix, so basically the decoder doesn't output any covariance matrix, it's, we are setting it fixed to I, then this term cancels and this term cancels, we are left with this. This one over L doesn't matter, we can throw it. The same for the ha half, we are, the argmax doesn't change, the maximum will change, but the values of these parameters won't change. The minus, if we are maximizing the minus, it's like minimizing the non-minus, we are left with this. And notice that now if we say, okay, um, suppose that our x hat is just the mu, whatever the decoder says is the mean, this is going to be our prediction for x hat, then this is exactly equal to x minus x hat. So this is one way that we can look at the objective. We have something that regularizes the latent space and we have this term over here that tries to reconstruct the image as best as possible. It's under certain assumption is actually exactly like the reconstruction term from a regular autoencoder, but under other assumptions, we can make it more fancy, okay? So this is one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is instead of looking at the terms, looking at the derivatives. And for illustration's sake, suppose we are actually separating the update rule into two. So suppose we are taking the gradients uh, once with regards to theta, so with regards to the decoder, and once with regards to phi, with regards to the encoder. In reality, we are doing both at the same time, but let's suppose for now that we are separating them into two. So when we take the gradient with regards to the parameters of the decoder, we are finding the decoder, we are finding the optimal decoder, but what we are doing is a sort of maximum likelihood, okay? So suppose the weights of the encoder are fixed, we are maximizing the likelihood of our data by changing the weights of the decoder. Now, if we suppose the other way around that the weights of the likelihood are fixed, then what we are doing when we are taking the derivative with regards to phi is variational inference. We are finding we are uncovering the approximated posterior, and by doing so, we also find the encoder. Okay, so just to recap, there are two moving parts here. It's not just variational inference, it's variational inference to find the encoder, and then maximum likelihood to find the decoder. Looking back at the same two pictures from before, if you change them from autoencoder to variational autoencoder, you get these two images. So before, you see that the zero, zero are here, for example, yeah? And then it spreads out in a very irregular way, yeah? And the same for here, zero, zero is here somewhere, but then it has these wings. It really looks like a flower or something, okay? If we move here, we see that the zero, zero is really here and everything is more, more or less in a round circle around it, okay? So it's more regularized. It's still not perfect. Maybe it won't be so perfect uh, for only two dimensions uh, because of the structure of the data, but it's better than before. So this is the effect basically that the KL has over uh, the latent space. Okay, so this is our latent space. Here we have Z1 and here we have Z2 yeah, in case you didn't get it from before. 
And this is an image from taken from the actual paper on two sets of data. This is on the MNIST data, and this is again the Z space where you have Z1, this is Z2. And you can see how you get really clear numbers. Um, each number basically has its own region in the latent Z space, more or less. Yes, some places are more blurry. And here they have on another data set, which is consisting of faces. And this is really nice. You can really see on this axis, you have frowning and smiling. And on this axis, you have uh, tilted to the left and tilted to the right. The latent space really found some interesting dimensions for the data. So for example, if you give it, if you take an image of yourself uh, frowning and you said, oh, I wish I could, I look really good in this picture. If only I could just be a little bit more smiling, then you just take the latent representation of it and you change this one axis. You keep all the other axes, but you change this one axis of the frowning, frowning smiling and you just change it from frowning to smiling, you pass it through the decoder and you get the same image or at least a similar image or a very close image at smiling. Okay, so this is all for this video. I hope you enjoyed and see you in the next one.